Greetings and salutations! This video is going to be about the top five things I love about Linux. I'm talking about the stuff that attracted me to Linux in the first place and the reason why I continue to use it every day and why I have started the Easy Linux project and post these videos and do all this stuff. I think it would be fun to go through them. This is not the top five things that I think you should love about Linux. This is what I love about Linux. So let's get to it. Starting at number five, one of the things I really love about Linux is the community that surrounds it. Now I know that the Linux community catches a lot of negative crap from people. Even I myself have complained about some people in the Linux community. But you know what? The truth of the matter is, is that most of the folks that contribute to Linux and help other Linux users are really kind people who will do most anything to get you started and to help you along your way. And a lot of people have helped me over the years. It has been a wonderful experience talking to people all around the world. And it doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter what their politics or religion or the color of their skin or any of that stuff. We have this common language. It's called Linux. So we can talk about it and we can share. It's one of the few really good things going on in the world, even though, like any other community, there are a few folks out there who are not so nice to be around. It's all about sharing anyway. Linus Torvalds, the fellow that created the Linux kernel way back in 1991, could have very well taken his code and could have locked it down, could have tried to sell it, could have tried to license it, could have tried to make a fortune off of it. He didn't. He just gave it away. He just put it up on this new thing called the Internet. And because he did that, now we have this federated operating system because it's not just Linux I mean it's parts of GNU and it's whatever desktop environment you're using like GNOME KDE all of these things contribute to what looks and acts like an operating system and it's a wonderful groovy thing and it's one of the really nice things going on in the world another thing about that community is the fact that you would be surprised how easy it is to contact people who are in charge of Linux distributions. We're looking at the Ubuntu wiki right now, but check this out. Here is the GitHub page for LMDE3, Linux Mint Debian Edition 3 Cindy, which is now in beta. I reported an issue. Who Who is the person that contacted me when I reported my issue that I was having while I was testing this? None other than Clem Lefebvre, who is the head of the Linux Mint project. Actually, gave me a solution that worked so I could keep testing LMDE3 on my machine. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine if something goes wrong with your Windows machine? Could you contact Bill Gates and have him fix it for you? Could, will he help you with it? Would he talk to you at all? No. What if Steve Jobs was still alive? If something happened to your Mac, you wouldn't be calling Steve Jobs up in his office and going, yo, Steve, I got this problem with my Mac. No, it wouldn't happen. But in the Linux world, because of the way the community is structured and the fact that we have so many different distributions of Linux and so many different people working on things, these people are quite accessible. I, on occasion, talk to people like Martin Wimpress and Alan Pope from Ubuntu. I've kind of nodded at Will Cook every now and again in a comment here and there. These are very high up people who are working on Ubuntu. And that's true of any distribution of Linux. If it's got a good community around it and you want to use it, most likely you're going to be able to get help with it. So that's pretty awesome. Take, for instance, the Linux Mint forums here. You can jump in here and you can ask a question. But not only that, Usually, if you have a problem with your Linux machine, if you're trying to do something, somebody out there has tried to do the same thing. And they will have, maybe not your solution, but they might have enough information that will point you in the right direction. So a little bit of time spent doing a little searching can solve a lot of problems with Linux. And the more you get to know the system and the more well-versed you are with it, the easier it is to find this information because you can look at things and recognize that, oh, this is what I need. This is the direction I need to go. The Linux community is awesome. And like I said earlier, a lot of folks concentrate on the negatives. The positives 
far outweigh the negatives. And the Linux community comes in as the number five thing I love about Linux. Number four on my list of top five things I love about Linux is scalability and flexibility. First, we'll talk about scalability. They are interrelated. Scalability means that you can make Linux do whatever you want to on any hardware that will run it. So Linux will run everything from a Raspberry Pi, which is a cheap one card little computer, all the way up to the world's supercomputers. Everything in between, smartphones, anything that has a processing chip in it that can run an operating system will run Linux and probably does run Linux. Linux runs the world, the Internet of Things. It runs all of your little devices in your house that are smart devices and hook up and do something. And it can run on just about any computer hardware out there. And when I say any computer hardware, I mean it. I have said for years to newbies, you know, be real careful about the hardware that you get because some machines are harder to install Linux on than others. But if you're not a newbie and if you're willing to take the time, you can get Linux to run on just about any computer that has been built in the last 20 years. It is absolutely amazing. So that is one of the things that I absolutely love about it. There is no artificial end of life on hardware like you get from Apple and even Microsoft tries to do that. Apple just decides, hey, we're not going to support this hardware anymore. Well, guess what a lot of people do with that hardware? They put Linux on it and it continues to move on and still serve and be productive. My brother, for instance, has a computer that now is over 10 years old, which is running Ubuntu Mate, the 32-bit version. We're talking 1804. No, it is not the most high-performance machine on the planet. Yes, there are certain things that he can't do with it, but for what he wants to do with his computer, which is pretty basic stuff like email, watch a few YouTube videos, upload a couple of YouTube videos, that sort of thing, it's doing fine for him. It's amazing. And like I said, the machine is over 10 years old. If it breaks, he doesn't lose a whole lot. He can just get himself another one, another used computer, load it up and keep rocking down the highway and that's exactly the way I do my own network of computers in my house they're all used if one of them dies eh, no big deal I didn't dump eight nine hundred several thousand dollars into these machines anyway and they're easy to get the used market is absolutely huge now let's talk about flexibility 99 percent of the people who use Linux, even people who are Linux power users, do not take advantage of the ability to customize the system that is available. Linux can be turned into anything that you want it to be. That's why it is so popular for things like kiosks, set-top boxes, stuff like that, because it doesn't necessarily have to be a traditional desktop with all the bells and whistles and features. If you know what you're doing, you can make Linux be very focused on what it can do, or you can make it where it can do a huge number of things. It all depends on your skill level and how much you want to get in, get your hands dirty, and get things done. What you're seeing on your screen is the bash RC file. Everybody who opens up a terminal gets a bash RC file. It's there. It's created automatically. And you can go in and edit this file, and you can change the properties in this file and different things that it does to make the system do what you want it to do. Now, of course, we're talking about when you open a terminal and you are running the bash shell. If you want to modify other things about the system, there are other files and other things you have to tweak, of course. But this is a really good example. So, for instance, I like to have a certain kind of prompt when I open up a terminal. I like a prompt that is going to be very compact and easy to see. So if I make this bigger so you guys can see my prompt, I'll give you a really quick example here. So let me go CD documents and I'm going to go into my scripts folder and I'm going to go into uh, get projects and I'm going to go into up for instance. 
Okay, so this is my path that I'm going to go and look into. You'll notice that on my prompt, it only says up, whereas on the regular prompt that usually comes with Ubuntu, Linux Mint, and many other distributions of Linux, what you get is the whole path. Well, that's a little cumbersome. So I have modified my prompt to be very compact and only show me information that I really need. It shows that I'm logged in as myself. It shows that I am in my machine called Big Boy. It shows that I am in the up directory and it shows that I am using standard privileges. I'm not logged in as root and the dollar sign shows me that. All of that information on that one little prompt and you can put a lot more there if you want to. You can have it show you the time. It's endless. And that's one of the things I love about Linux. You can go and you can look this stuff up. You can learn about it and you can make it do whatever you want it to do. So the number four thing that I love about Linux is flexibility and scalability. We're up to the number three thing that I love the most about Linux. And it can be said in one word, bash the born again shell it is a universal language for communicating with a computer a shell is a command line interpreter which means that you type a command in and this program interprets it and then gives it to the computer in a way that will actually make the hardware do something so it makes working with a computer more friendly and a lot more human because you're using a language bash is not only an interpreter it is a language in and of itself that you can write programs in those programs are called scripts and a script can be anything from two lines all the way up to six eight hundred lines as in the case of uh, XBT, the external backup tool a program that I've written and is available for you to download and it's just amazing what you can do here not only that Bash is universal. It runs on every kind of computer in the world. It doesn't make any difference whether you're running Linux, Unix, Mac, Windows. Bash is available to you, and it is extremely powerful. You can use tools in Bash like SSH and SFTP and FTP and many other tools to communicate with other machines to get information. So it, it just absolutely incredible the amount of power that's at your fingertips if you take the time to learn how to use it. One of the things that I'm not down with at all are those people out there who are constantly bashing on anybody who uses a terminal and says, well, you shouldn't use a terminal. You shouldn't have to use a terminal if you're in Linux. It should all be point and click. You are throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You have no clue of what you speak when you say things like that because yes the terminal requires learning but once you learn how to use it it is so powerful you can get information about every command that you can run in the terminal you can get on the internet and surf the web from a terminal using bash using programs that are designed to run in the terminal there are people in the linux world who don't run desktops they live a hundred percent in a terminal so just to give you some examples one of the things that you can do quite easily with your terminal is you can be working with your machines and finding out all kinds of information. You speak directly to the machine. You get information about what it is doing and you can do in just a few simple commands what would take a lot of pointing and clicking to do. It is extremely powerful that way. One person said that graphic user interface type desktops make easy tasks easier but the command line makes complex tasks possible because if you tried to do a lot of things that you want to do when you're administering a Linux system by all point and click it would take you forever whereas you can write your own scripts you can automate things you can really get it down to where you do one or two little things Boom, the system goes off and does what you want it to do. For instance, another program that I wrote, it's a little program called Up. Up automatically updates my system and it does a lot of other things too. So I can do this in one fell swoop. It's going out, it's checking it for updates, it's going to install those updates, and it's going to tell me exactly what it's doing as it rolls along. Now, even if I was doing that with a desktop, where I was pointing and clicking and I was opening up the update tool, 
I couldn't have done it that quickly. There's no way. That's the power of the terminal right there. Another thing is the fact that when you are working in Bash, you can communicate with other machines. This particular terminal that you're looking at right now is logged in to my web page server. This machine is not even residing in my house. It's somewhere out there in some data center uh, somewhere. All I know is it's around Dallas somewhere, Dallas, Texas. There it is. But I have complete access and control of this machine. So I can use my HTOP program there as well. And I can very quickly see how long the machine's been up. See, it's been up for four days. It's showing me all of the processes that are running, how much memory is taken up, all kinds of stuff like that. And if I don't want to use HTOP, there are other tools. I can use the old top command. It's been around in Linux forever. There is a set of Linux tools that run in Bash or just Bash tools that are pretty much there no matter what kind of machine you sit down in front of. It makes no difference whatsoever. If you sit down in front of a Windows machine that's got an Ubuntu Linux subsystem running on it and you log into Bash, you can pretty much be assured that all of the tools are there. For my web server here, this is running CentOS. This isn't even close to Ubuntu. However, guess what? A lot of those same tools are there and it's not that hard to figure out how to work with another distribution if you'd know those basics. Yes, things change from OpenSUSE to Red Hat and CentOS and Fedora to Ubuntu to all of the different distributions. But the truth of the matter is, it's not that big a deal. And if you really get into this, if you dive deep into it, you'll find out that you can do a lot. This is my XBT program, which is written for Bash, which means that it will run on just about any system out there. Now, there are some things that limit it to being run on Debian systems. This runs on Debian, it runs on Ubuntu, it'll run on Linux Mint, anything based on Ubuntu should have no problems. But that is because the systems are different. If it wasn't such a, a specific program, it would run on anything. It could be made to run on anything. You can go and you can grab the code and you could make it run on your system regardless of what you're running. It's just little things like right here where it's looking for a drive that is in a, a directory called media. Okay, some Linux systems, they don't use that. They mount it somewhere else. That's the only thing that has to change. So you could come and you could grab this program and you're more than welcome to. You could grab it off my GitHub page and you can do whatever you want with it. It's very cool and very powerful, and that is one of the fun things about working with Linux, is the more you learn, the more power you have, the more you can do with it. And Bash is your gateway to all of it. It is the real, true power of using the Linux operating system. So, number three, definitely, is Bash. We're up to number two on my list of favorite things about Linux. And we are going to talk about file structure, also known as the file system or the file hierarchy, because it is one of the things about the Unix and Linux operating system that I absolutely love. Remember that Linux is a workalike of Unix, so they share a lot of the same basic uh, things, you know, as far as how they're structured. And one of those things that I love is this file system. The concept is very simple. Everything starts at root. Root is represented by a slash at the top of your screen. And each one of these directories, they hold something that is important to the system. So this is a much simplified version here. ETC is short for etc. And it holds configuration files of some sort. Dev is where all of the devices are represented on a Unix or Linux system. Keep in mind that everything on Unix and Linux is a file. Even your keyboard, it's represented as a file. Your hard drive is represented as a file. The microphone I'm using to record this video, it is represented to the system as a file, a directory, a place where data is stored. Then we have the home directory, and inside that we have the you know actual people's accounts and where they hold their personal data. And then we have directories within that. 
Also, we have USR, which is not short for user. It's Universal System Resources, and that is where a lot of your programs and things like desktop icons are stored, something that all of the users on the system. And then we have the var directory, which is short for variable. The variable directory holds logs and unread email if you have an internal email system set up on your Linux system. The beautiful thing about this is the fact that this is once again scalable. It can be on a simple little desktop, laptop computer with a single hard drive in it, or it can be on a supercomputer that has hundreds of, of storage devices and different network connections coming into it. Each one of those devices and connections is represented by a folder. The concept of being able to mount a device in a directory or a file on Linux that is so powerful because you can move things around you can do all kinds of very interesting things not too long ago I was doing some maintenance on my mom's computer the way I had the file systems set up across different partitions I didn't like that I wanted to change it I didn't have to reinstall everything on her computer all I had to do was to change the FS tab file which tells the system where all of this stuff is and then I just moved the data to the new partitions that I wanted it to be in and rebooted and boom it was there it's an awesome thing to work with and it's one of the things that I really really love about Linux here's what it looks like on here's what it looks like on a typical Ubuntu setup this is actually my Ubuntu setup on the machine that I'm working with so at the top you'll see the root directory and we'll see more of the same of uh, the directories that we saw in the chart which is behind this this is the actual listing of what's on this machine and you'll see that uh, for instance we have opt here which is for optional software in Linux uh, we have a bin directory which is short for binaries this is where system binaries are stored tools things like that and then you'll see sys which is a, another system directory uh, we have a root directory but not to be confused with the slash which represents the root of the file system the root directory is the home directory for the super user the one user on the computer that has full power over the system you have a temp directory which does exactly what you think it should it stores temporary files and by the way all users have access to the temp directory it's uh, not locked down you don't have to be root to use it and then I have listed the storage in my own personal home directory and you see that I have uh, a directory called audio which stores all kinds of non musical audio files and then we have bin which is where I put my binary files we have chart hits archive which is a bunch of music we've got a desktop we've got documents downloads all that stuff that you're used to and then I have listed my bin folder in there to show all of the little uh, programs and things that I use on a daily basis. This is scalable. It doesn't matter whether you have one user or if you have 300 users. This file system can accommodate whatever you throw at it. And it is one of my favorite parts of the Linux system. So the number two thing that I love about Linux is the file structure, file system, or file hierarchy, whatever you want to call it. We have now reached the number one spot on the top five list of the things that I love about Linux. Can you guess what that might be? <laughs> number one, Linux is free. And I mean free in both senses of the word. Free as in free of cost and free as in free, as in open, as in they can't hide anything from you. You are free to do anything you'd like with Linux and you are free to see what it is doing and you are free to modify it at any time. It is completely free and that openness is one of the reasons why we don't have to deal with so many different viruses and malware in Linux because there's no place for those kind of people that want to do malicious things on your computer to hide. And if they do try and get something in there, the community is is always watching the code and watching the projects watching the packages that go into the systems and it's caught pretty quickly 
That is one of the main reasons that I switched over to Linux, is to get away from the malware and the viruses that plagued the Windows operating system. It got to the point where it was absolutely ridiculous. I used to do freelance computing, uh, computer work for people and one of the main things that I did was clean out Windows systems, either by reloading them or going through and removing all of the viruses. And since I have started to use Linux, and I have used Linux for 10 years, I have never, not once, had any of my machines come up with any sort of infection. It is absolutely a waste of time to be running antivirus on your home desktop Linux system. If you have a server that's going to be dealing with a lot of files that are going out to Windows computers and other diff phones and different operating systems, then yes, you probably want to have some sort of virus scanning so you can catch things. But if you're talking about a home Linux system, you absolutely do not need any of that kind of software. Just running your updates and patching your system when vulnerabilities are found is quite enough to keep the bad people out. Now, no system anywhere is absolutely 100% foolproof, and if somebody really wants to get at you, they're going to do it regardless, but you are way less likely to have that sort of a problem with a Linux system than you are with a Windows computer or even a Mac system. Can it happen? Sure. Will it happen? Probably not. And let's talk about freedom in the sense of it being absolutely free. I have an entire household full of computers that I have built and installed Linux on and my family uses. And the total cost for investing in all of these machines is probably at this point under $1,000. That's talking about buying the hardware and stuff to go along with it simply because of the fact that I didn't have to go out and spend $800 for a new machine and I didn't have to spend a hundred or so dollars for a license for an operating system because with Linux you can download it and use it whenever you want to on whatever you want to however you want to use it not only that when you download it you can give it to your friend you can walk over to your friend's house and say, hey, let me load this up on your old computer over in the corner and you can play with it for a while. It's encouraged in the Linux community. Absolutely, we want you to share what we do. I have written software which you can go and download off of GitHub and you can do with it as you please. As long as you follow the terms of the GPL 2, that's fine. You know, give me credit send me your patches that's all I ask and if you're gonna fork it change the name that's all there is to it but that software is freely available for anybody to use and that is totally awesome now just because something is open source and free doesn't necessarily mean that it's totally free of charge some people out there they do charge a little bit for their software it may be free and open source, but hey, people got to eat. And if that's what they decide to do, it's perfectly all right. So keep that in mind as you go through your Linux journey. Just like this slide says, Linux is a community. It's not a product. You can use it for free, but it is not a free ride. It would not be what it is today without conscientious users who contribute to the projects and buy from companies that embrace Linux. So you do the same thing. If Linux is important to you and this freedom make sure that you support the people that make it happen with monetary donations if you can't contribute to the community in a monetary way you can contribute in a million other ways you can do bug testing which is something that I'm doing right now for the Linux Mint project you can contribute artwork you can translate languages there are so many different ways to get involved with the Linux community and keep it free and open because that is what's going to do it is participation you being a part of the Linux community if you're going to use it every day then you need to figure out a way to contribute you don't have to be a developer you don't have to write code to do that just if everybody does a little bit a whole lot gets done and that's exactly how Linux works and one of the reasons that it is possible to do that is because it is free you can use it and you can do anything you want with it and you can see anything about it 
So the number one thing that I absolutely positively love about Linux, the reason why I have stuck with Linux, even though when I started out, just like a lot of other newbies, it got very frustrating and there was a lot to learn. I stuck with it because this was free. It wasn't going to be taken away from me and nobody was going to artificially end support on a machine that still had plenty of life in it, which is something that Apple and Microsoft both try and do, which I have mentioned earlier in this video. It can't be taken away from you. There will always be some Linux out there for you to use. Even if your favorite distribution of Linux just goes poof, don't worry about it. You can pick up and use another distribution and you can do it for free and you can do it freely. Can't say that about the commercial proprietary systems, folks. It's the number one thing about Linux that makes it great. It is free. Thank you for watching this video. It was just a bit of fun on my part, and I hope that you got something out of it. Feel free to share it if you'd like to, you know, get somebody else interested in Linux. And if you would, I would love to hear your feedback. Please be sure to give Easy Linux a like on Facebook if you are a Facebook user. And if you are somebody who wants to learn more about Linux, check out freedompenguin.com for more about Linux from contributors such as myself. Also, check out easylinux.com because that's sort of the clearinghouse for the entire Easy Linux project, which is what you're watching right now. <laughs> and uh, I would appreciate you checking that out and uh, seeing what that is all about. And thank you once again for watching. We'll do it again soon.